This is the Tom Anderson Show, broadcasting live from the KVNT studios, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. Well, some people just have the gift of writing and authorship, and our next guest certainly would be in that category, over 40 books, and his genre particularly is World War II and many of the books on German armed forces. And this book may be his best, The Death of Hitler's War Machine, The Final Destruction of the Wehrmacht. Samuel Mitchum, Jr., out of the great state of Louisiana, joins us. And Sam, today is your big day, and you're launching, it looks like, a very popular book, soon to be, are you doing the rounds and, and making making it count in your interviews, I presume? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm definitely do it. Oh, good. I, I, I tell you right now, this is something near and dear to my heart. Family from Germany on mom's side. Mom was born in Leipzig and, and lived in Germany, in Berlin during World War II with her younger brother and at one part orphan long story but the the destruction there and we can get into that with your book you know folks right now especially we had something in alaska with a a license plate uh three reich and fuhrer got past the state of alaska uh, dmv and now the the owners of those vehicles are being highlighted because i don't think folks like that and your book highlights as well very definitively what happened in Hitler's demise, but there are a lot of folks in Germany who weren't involved, certainly with the military, and look at this and I think take great solace and and bow their head at what happened. Let's get into the book itself. What inspired you to write this particular book? Well, uh, I was uh, visiting the U.S. National Archives looking for something very specific. And they let me in an area where they don't let the general public. And I befriended uh, one of the guys there. His name was Garrett Gegner. He had uh, read, read several of my books before. And uh, he was looking through a filing cabinet. And I asked him what he was looking for. And he said, Hitler's last will and testament. And I said, is that here? And he said, well, not here. And said, I have a copy. Uh, we have an original in the vault. Uh, but nobody gets to see that. And uh, we talked for a while. Several other people came in. We got a bull session going. And he disappeared for a while and came back. He had gone to the vault and checked out the actual copy of Hitler's last will and testament. And, of course, there were five signatories there, and they were all dead within three days. And uh, he, uh, he said, uh, uh, close your eyes put your nose to the paper, and smell it. And I did. And the uh, odor of the filler bunker had permeated that paper. You could smell the dankness and the dampness and the smoke. And, uh, and for just a second, I had the uh, sensation of actually being in the filler bunker. And it was a surreal moment. I lifted my nose to the paper, looked at him, and uh, said, Wow. And he said, exactly. And uh, I guess that, more than anything else, is kind of what inspired me to do it. It was, uh, um, it was an interesting uh, experience. H- Hitler was many things. There are some successes initially, and you've certainly written about that, as he, his you know, military virgin, and he had great expectations and great plans. And then, of course, they came to not an abrupt but close enough close when he overextended himself. And certainly you you highlight that, talking about after Battle of the Bulge and Battle of the Bulge and then and then in, on the Eastern Front. So many different areas there we could get into. But do you think that Hitler's foreign policy and the failures – uh, really, really screwed the Wehrmacht because he put them against the world. I was shocked when I've read history. I thought as smart as Hitler was, why didn't he, you know, placate or work with folks? It, it was amazing that he thought he could just take it over, kind of Romanesque, 
uh, mentality or a Napoleonic mentality. Yeah, he did. Of course, Napoleon's a man who said that uh, great empires dive into gesture. Um, Hitler uh, uh, overextended himself. He had bad foreign policy, and he uh, uh, he was uh, what might be called a micromanager uh, to an extreme degree, and that doesn't work well in the military sphere. He also practiced divide and rule, which works in politics, but not in uh, not in warfare. Um, he, uh, I think Hitler was on a delicate mental perch. And at some point, he fell off. Um, I would say about September 1942, but he always had that megalomania. Uh, he always thought he knew better than anyone else. Well, and to think that he refused to, you know, I mean, acknowledge that if you don't retreat, just in military you know, basics, you don't even have to be a soldier to get that, and you continually push that rule in warfare, you will lose. And and Stalin seemed to do it. He had so many so many soldiers, I guess he could, and it's horrific what, what he did if you want to talk about deaths, and I'm sure you've written about that as well in Russia. But Hitler refused. He forbade German troops, essentially condemning them to death from retreating. Well, again, was this just insanity, or did he have a rhyme or reason to that? order to not retreat. His highest military training was corporal, and that really doesn't qualify you to run a war, but he, he thought it did. And in Norway, 1940, up around Narvik, uh, he was uh, going into hysterics because the British uh, landed at Narvik, took the town, his men were uh, pushed against the uh, Swedish border. And he wanted to retreat then, and Yodel and um, Bernard, uh, one of his uh, top generals, uh, convinced him not to. And uh, the British evacuated because France was being overrun. And uh, Hitler uh, took the wrong lesson from that. After that, he would not authorize retreats when they were necessary. And he certainly didn't uh, on the Eastern Front. Uh, the East was much different from the West. Uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, the uh, soldiers in the West were, uh, in many cases, ready to give up. Um, they saw the writing on the wall. They had been in war for five years. They were on Germany's border, and they saw they couldn't win. Uh, matter of fact, I go into detail in my book about the uh, Battle of the Ruhr Pocket. We took over 300,000 German prisoners and our total casualties were 17,000. It's one of the most lopsided victories in history. On the Eastern Front, it was just the opposite because the Russians uh, were engaged in murder and terrorism and arson and rape. Uh, rape on an unprecedented scale in, in modern history. And uh, that caused the German soldier to uh, fight like the Dickens. And uh, so it was like two different wars, the East and the West. We're talking with Samuel Mitchum, Jr., his book released today, so we're quite honored. Regnery helped assist with that, and we have him on talking about the death of Hitler's war machine, the final destruction of the Wehrmacht. Next segment, we're going to keep Sam on if he has time, and we'll talk about how you can purchase it. And I recommend don't just get it for yourself, but help Sam out. Buy a few because he worked really hard on this, and give it as a gift, especially to the folks, men and women, that would be interested in this and it would be good for students as well i think i may purchase a copy for my 14 year old sam my mother in in berlin a, a youngster was there and and you brought up something that that is really makes folks shudder especially if you're a child or a female back then her her family said do not go out in the streets at night and they were in fear specifically of russian soldiers and getting assaulted and so i have some stories of that of folks mom knew 
Uh, very horrific what the Russians did. We so often pick on the Germans, but I mean, the transgressions are abound on that. We're going to come back and I want to ask Sam, he can think about this one, why the Wehrmacht was slowly annihilated. Horrific battles, the most brutal of which was the Soviet siege of Budapest. So we're going to talk about the Stalingrad of the Waffen SS. That's something that I'm interested in. So stay with us. Samuel Mitchum, the death of Hitler's war machine here on the Tom Anderson Show. This is the Tom Anderson Show, broadcasting live from the KVNT studios, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. Military historian Dr. Samuel Mitchum joins us, and some would say it's the capstone of a career, over 40 books, most of them on German armed forces in World War II, and it's an honor, as I mentioned last segment, to have him come on the show the day his book is released. The book is The Death of Hitler's War Machine, The Final Destruction of the Wehrmacht. What happened at the very end uh, to Hitler's regime and army? And Sam, how do, how do we purchase your book? I know you're going to say online, but what are the best ways to do that? And what would you prefer? Well, regular history offers it. Uh... Uh, Amazon.com, uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, I I don't have any preference in how people uh, uh, purchase it, just just as long as they purchase it. Absolutely. Well, before we left last segment, why the Wehrmacht was slowly annihilated in some say horrific battles. The most brutal was that Soviet siege of of Budapest, which became known as the Stalingrad of the Waffen SS. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, it was one of Hitler's hold at all cost orders. He uh, wanted to hold uh, Budapest. He felt like that was a key. And uh, he uh, actually reinforced the southern end of the Eastern Front uh, at the expense of the defenders of Berlin. And uh, they had an SS uh, Corps there, the 9th SS Corps in Budapest. And uh, they put up one heck of a fight. They had uh, two SS uh, cavalry divisions, which uh, were dismounted. They didn't have horses. Uh, you had the 13th Panzer, which was one of the better divisions in the world, and uh, uh, the 60th uh, uh, Panzer, uh, Grenadier, which uh, the Feldenhall Division, it was uh, also excellent. And the Russians, I think, made a mistake by being so brutal on the civilians, not only of uh, Hungary, but also Germany, Poland, uh, even went through Yugoslavia, and uh, uh, alienated a lot of them by their actions. And um, they uh, they were surrounded, and these boys dug their uh, heels in, and uh, uh, the Russians literally had to beat them to death. Uh, uh, started out with... Uh, uh, 33,000 Germans and Hungarians who fought pretty well. And uh, only about 800 of them escaped. Uh, but they went house to house, and uh, the fighting was brutal. Uh, Stalin didn't much care how many men he lost, and uh, he, he lost a ton of result. But uh, he, he could afford it because... Uh, on the Eastern Front, there were 7 million uh, Soviet troops uh, in 1945. Uh, Germany had less than 1.8 million. Uh, so it was uh, a battle of material. And uh, Soviet tanks were, in most cases, as good as the Germans. Yeah, that the, the numbers, it's hard for me to get my brain around those numbers when I when I read about them, and especially the Soviets, I think, good Lord. A lot of folks listening, we have up here in Alaska, and we're going to make a YouTube video of this, so folks, you can go to TomAndersonShow.com, and, and so can Sam, and listen to the podcast. You can, you can pull it out if you want to send it to somebody uh, as an audio clip, or you can go to YouTube, give us about a day, and we'll have a nice YouTube video with this interview that you can share as well. Uh, the loss of the air war, and I, I brought up Alaska, we have a lot of pilots up there, up here, as you know, in the last frontier and commercial and, and small plane per capita more than any other state. 
Uh, they're interested in this. 1943 to 44 led to the devastation of German cities. I mentioned my mom in Leipzig right next door is Dresden. And what happened there right at the end of World War II, pretty sad when the Allies bombed that. Complete disruption of industry, infrastructure, that couldn't have helped. Uh, if, if Hitler had any momentum at that point or was fading away, th that certainly added to his demise, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, not only the uh, northern sector of the eastern front there, uh, Germany had 300 aircraft, the Russians had 10,000. Uh, of course, we firebombed Dresden. You could see the fireball 200 miles away. The asphalt on the streets actually caught on fire. And that burned 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that was, um, they, they lost at least 100,000 and possibly 125,000 people in Dresden. And only about 50,000 were killed in the whole Battle of Britain. So they lost more than twice as many people in, in that one firebombing. Yeah, no, it was, we were, our family talks often about, because all of them were in Leipzig, which is very close. If, for those of you in Alaska, it's like an, driving from Anchorage to Wasilla. And, and it's like, whoa, uh, we're very glad, you know, Leipzig with von Goethe and, and Mendelssohn and Richard Wagner, so much art, the first coffee shop in Europe. I, I've been there so many times and to Dresden, and Dresden's been rebuilt, but I'm glad <laughs> they didn't go after Leipzig too. Um, no, it's it's the, the what I didn't know was one of the numbers you just tossed out, which is how many Russian planes there were. How on earth did they manufacture such? I always thought and was under the the uh, you know uh, I guess education that they didn't have the resources. And you mentioned tanks uh, in in terms of technology comparable to the Panzer. I had no idea about that that Russia was so up to speed. They were. They, they used their own tanks. They used our trucks. To, uh, um, the, term, the word Studebaker, for example, was synonymous with trucks in the Soviet Union in the 1950s. We sent them so many vehicles. Um, they didn't like our Shermans, our tanks, and rarely used them. Uh, I've only run across one case where they actually used Sherman tanks. Um, but the Shermans uh, had narrow tracks which weren't very good in mud. There was a lot of mud on the eastern front. Uh, that's why the uh, Tiger and the Panther did a lot better in western front than our Shermans. If you had to pick a best tank and a best plane, uh, for not for bombing, but for, for uh, you know, fighting, dog fighting, what would you pick? Because I've, you know, the Spitfire and the, the Mitchell Schmidt, and I've heard, and, uh, you know, the Panzer, we talked about tanks as well. What, what would be your, what would you say was all around the best for those? Or does it depend on the warfare, like, you know, Europe versus Africa? Well, it's a whole different uh, air war. Um, in Russia, they've, they fought almost at ground level, 100, 300 feet off the uh, deck. Um, in the West, they would fly over at over 30,000 feet with our uh, bombers. Uh, so um, I would say the best tank was the Panther. That's what most Germans think uh, uh, who survived the war. The Tiger was uh, impressive, but uh, it wasn't as mechanically reliable and the rate of turn of their turrets was extremely slow. Uh, the Panther had uh, great, greater mechanical reliability, and it didn't use as much fuel, and that was an issue, uh, because we just destroyed the oil refineries. Uh, uh, near the end of the war, the Germans actually came up with a training manual how to drain a tank a gas tank of a uh, disabled panzer under enemy fire. Now, if you're uh, if you have to drain a gas tank under fire, you're low in fuel, and uh, well, that was a problem. Like at Romagen, when we captured the bridge, uh, Field Marshal Model, the German commander, took the right steps and gave the right orders, but uh, the panzer divisions didn't have enough uh, petroleum. Uh, to carry them out. Uh, and that was, uh, I think, the uh, loss of Remagen was the greatest psychological blow 
and probably the final psychological blow on the Western Front. Uh, that allowed us to encircle the Ruhr, their industrial heartland, and the uh, the German soldiers had spoken uh, by that time. They were ready to go home. And uh, we um, captured over 300,000 German troops at a loss of 17,000 American casualties. Yeah, it by the by the demise and by the end and the, the end of Hitler, very unremarkable and the tragedy, you know, on both sides. It, it it it's prolific, my friend. I appreciate the fact we'd love to get you back in the future. The book is the death of Hitler's war machine, the final destruction of the Wehrmacht. These segments go by so quickly. I have a lot more questions. That'll be in the future. Samuel Mitchum Jr. is his name. Over forty books. This may be his capstone. Samuel, I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Paul Colley will do it again. Absolutely. Folks, I encourage you to purchase that book. I definitely will. Stay with us. Tom Anderson Show.